Welcome back. So, we've looked at the basic group consultation in the previous sections, and now let's come to the complex group. So, complex group, as you can see, the name is complex, but in fact, it is not that complex as, at all. Because all you need to do is to do two accounting adjustments only on top of these basic group consultation. So, what do I mean by basic group and what do I mean by complex group is this. Within the basic group, all you've got is the parents and under which there will be a subsidiary. Or perhaps there will be multiple subsidiaries under the parents' company. But within the complex group, the only difference between these two is that under the subsidiary, there will be something called the sub-subsidiary. Or perhaps, as you can see, we got another sub subsidiary. And that means if under the subsidiary there will be sub subsidiary, that would be complex. Okay, you have to do two other adjustments related to it on top of this basic group. Anything else? Just to be the same as in the basic group. Okay? Right, so we know that difference already. So as you can see, we've got the vertical group. The simple group, so that means, as you can see, the parent owns 70% of the subsidiary and the subsidiary owns 70% of the sub subsidiary. Okay, so the parent will control the sub subsidiary as well. But why this is the case then? Well, also we've got another group, so called D group structure, so that means not only the parent controls the sub subsidiary, but the parents will have the direct shareholding in the Sub subsidiary, so it's like a D, okay. But but the question is why the parents will have control over the sub subsidiary then. So remember, for complex group or basic group, uh, within the complex group, our aim for that is we're going to consolidate the sub sub subsidiary into the parent uh, account, not in the subsidiary's account, okay. So we are standing from a parent's perspective. So. Right, we know that um, there will be two additional accounting treatments that we need to do related to the complex group on top of this basic one. And let's now, first of all, have a go at something called the effective control. Okay, to see why, from the parents' company's perspective, we've got control over the sub subsidiary's company. So, before we move any further, just a little bit of exercises here. For example, we have apples, it's like the apple, just imagine that as an apple, my drawing is really bad. For example, we've got 10 apples here, that's called sub-subsidiary. The sub-subsidiary has 10 apples here, and for example, from a subsidiary's perspective, within that 10 apples, 7 apple belongs to a subsidiary, okay, so so-called the seven apples. So that means subsidiary owns 70% of the sub-subsidiary, you agree? Because we've got seven apples out of these ten apples that a sub-subsidiary has owned in the first place. So for example, from a parent's perspective, so out of these seven apple, I've owned for example, five apples out of these seven apples. So from that perspective, as you can see, from these seven apples, we've owned five apples in there. So this means that parents of subsidiary, we take five divided by seven, so that would give us about 70%, again, okay, it's about 71%, or 70% to 71% of the subsidiary. So, from that perspective then, here's the question. That, so, let's see then. So, from the sub-subsidiaries, sub, 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 sub apples, 10 apples, 7 of which belongs to the subsidiary, and from these 7 apples from the subsidiary, 5 of which belongs to the parent. So, that means out of these 
10 apples here. Five of them belongs to the parents' company, isn't it? So as you can see, so that means the parents owns approximately 50% of those 10 apples because as you can see, 70 times 70% 70 to round it up is about 50%, isn't it? So we own five apples out of this 10. So that's the logic behind it. So that means that 50% is the effective controlling interest. We simply take 70 times 70. So the effective NCI though would be another 50% because 100 minus 50. Okay, so that's the logic behind it. But why the sub subsidiary is controlled by the parent? Well, think about it in this way. Because the parent's company controls the subsidiary. Because I can vote for 70% of yeses, you have to go to India, for example. So the subsidiary has to go to India. But the subsidiary does not want itself to set up a company in India, but rather the sub subsidiary is based in India. And as a result of it, the subsidiary will say to that sub subsidiary, well, please go to India, you have to, because I vote for 70%. Again, yes, is that you have to set up a subsidiary, uh, you have to set up a factory in India, for example. And hence, as you can see, the sub subsidiary is controlled directly by the parent's company, because the parent controls the sub, and sub controls the sub sub. Okay, so that's the logic behind it. So in this question, is just to be the exercise for the effective control concept. So scenario number one. So here, the parents acquired 70% of the subsidiary, and then the subsidiary owns 70% of the sub subsidiary. So if that's the case, then first of all, from the parents' perspective, what is the effective controlling interest, or I can CI for short. Of course, we take 70 times 70, that will give us 49%. So the effective NCI percentage, from a parent's perspective, in relation to the sub subsidiary, will be 51%. Because added up, that will be 100. And of course, you can argue that from the subsidiary's perspective, not the parent's perspective, or on the other hand, from the subsidiary's perspective, that the controlling interest would be 70% over the sub subsidiary. Yeah, you agree? Because the subsidiary owes 70% in sub sub, and hence the NCI percentage would be 30% from the subsidiary's perspective, and hence added up to be 100%. But when we are preparing the group financial statements, all we have to consider is not from the subsidiary's perspective, but rather from a parent's perspective when acquiring that sub-subsidiary. So when talking about the sub-subsidiary to a parent, we are using the effective percentage here. So another exercise is the scenario number two, that indicating uh, the D group structure. So the scenario number one, is just to be the vertical group. So let's look at scenario number two. So scenario number two says the parent owns 70% of the subsidiary and the subsidiary owns 70% of the sub subsidiary. And also the parent owns 20% of that sub subsidiary. And as a result of it, as you can see, it's like the D, isn't it? So that's the D group structure. So we're required to calculate, again, the effective controlling interest. So when we are talking about the effective one, we are talking about the relationship between the parent and the sub-subsidiary, rather than the relationship between the subsidiary and the sub-sub, or the parent to the sub. Okay, so it's the parent to the sub-sub. So in this case, again, it's 70% times 70%, but also have to add the direct shareholding, which is worth about 20%. So it's to be 69% in this case, whereas the effective NCI 
would become 31%. Okay, so in relation to parents and the stop stop. So that's the logic behind it. So scenario two that will indicate that this will be a D group structure, as you can see before. Okay, the second of our scenario is like the D group structure. Or you can call it as the mixed group structure, if you like. So, I mean, that's the logic behind it. So that means, as you can see, um, if under the sub subsidiary, we've got sub-sub, okay, this type of structure we call the group structure. So all you can remember, again, is two different account adjustments only, or additional account adjustments that would, that would uh, need to be made, okay, in this case. So, there are three differences between the complex and simple group. Again, simple group, we've got the subsidiary only. For the complex group, we've got the sub-sub. First of all, is we're going to consider when should we consolidate the sub-subsidiary sub into a parent's group. So how are we going to do that then? The best way to look at this again is to directly have a go at the question called PATH POC. So we've got situation one and two. So we are going to see when should we consolidate the sub-subsidiary. Sub, okay, it's so the sub-sub in other words. So in this case, as you can see, the parents acquired 70% of South and then South owns 70% of serve. So that means to become, that becomes the sub-sub, isn't it? So the parents acquired the subsidiary on 1st January 2015, but the subsidiary acquires the sub-subsidiary on 1st January 2014. So that means on 1st January 2014, South is not the subsidiary of the parent, it's PATH. Because the parent hasn't got control on 1st January 2014, yeah? So that means on 1st January 2014, the sub-sub is called serve, is the subsidiary of the subsidiary, is the subsidiary of the South, in other words. So when the South comes into a group on 1st January 2015, both of these subsidiary and sub-sub becomes the components within the group. And hence, what we're going to do is to say the date that we consolidate the sub-sub is on 1st January 2015. And that's it. So the idea behind it is when the sub-sub becomes the components within the group from a parent's point of view. So let's look at the situation number two then. Again, we've got this company again. So we've got the PATH acquired 70% of SAF on 1st January 2015 and SAF owns 70% of SURF on 31st March 2015. So as you can say, when the South becomes the subsidiary of PATH, it's on 1st January 2015. You agree? But on that particular date, we haven't got a sub-sub in. Because the sub-sub will become the subsidiary of South only when it is on 31st March 2015. So from that perspective, only when on 31st March 2015, that the surf, which is the sub sub, becomes the components within the group and the hands being consolidated. And as you can see, the rules behind it is the later of these two dates so that um, we can consolidate that sub subsidiary into a group. Okay? So that's the idea behind it. Okay, right. So we know the first. Um, I mean, the difference, the complication comes in, but there we've with that already. And now let's look at the second as well as the third one, is the growth and one double entry. So, as you can see, when consolidated the soft sub into a parents group account, 
All we have to do is this. For sub sub, all we have to do, first of all, when calculating, for example, I, I've got the effective controlling interest of uh, 60%, for example. Now, of course, if you make 100 profit, $100 worth of profit from the sub sub's perspective, $60 will belong to the company, yeah? So that's the reason why, when calculating the growth of that sub sub, in relation to the reserve as well as the NCI, we have to use the effective percentage. And that's it. Because we are standing from a parent's perspective. We are not standing from the subsidiary's perspective. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. And also we need to make one double entry for this. Okay? So that double entry simply we debit the NCI and credit the goodwill. But the question is how are we going to do that then? The best way that I can show you is to directly have a go at the question called Patrick POC and we're going to explain the logic behind it. Okay? So, required, calculate the goodwill, NCI and constated reserve and we are using the same approach as what we've seen before. Patrick. So, Need for page, so working one will be the group structure of the Patrick group. Working two will be the subsidiaries net assets. And in this case, we've got two subsidiaries in there. And one is called SUBA, it's a subsidiary within the group. And then one is the sub sub, it's called SOUL. So one is called SUPA, one is called SOUL at the acquisition date, that's at the year end. And then working free, of course, we're going to calculate the goodwill. So when calculating goodwill, as you can see, again, for super and so, we're going to use the fair value of consideration. plus the NCI and we're going to minus the fair value of the net assets at the date of acquisition so that would give us the goodwill at acquisition date okay working for we've got the NCI Again, we've got super and so. First of all, we've got the NCI taken from the working three, and then we're going to plot the growth for this. And then it gives us the NCI. Working five. Later to reserve. Of course, we are considering from a parent's perspective, so parent's reserve. And then we're going to plot the growth of the uh, subsidiary as well as the sub sub. And hence, it will give us the total reserve at the year end. So let's read through the scenario just for fun, first of all, to put all of these bits and pieces here. So we're told that Patrick is the parent, acquired 75 of Super and 25 of So, and Super owns 40% of So. So if that's the case then, the Patrick then we've got Super and we've got So. So Patrick owns 75% of Super, Super owns 40% of Seoul, and then Patrick owns another 25% of Seoul. So if that's the case, then of course the Seoul will be the sub-subsidiary of the Patrick company, and surely will be the associate from the Super company's perspective. And hence from Patrick's perspective, from the uh, parent's perspective, so parent to this soul 
the effective controlling interest percentage will simply be 75% out of its 40. We're going to plot another 25% of the direct shareholding. It will give us 55%. Same as before. And hence we can work out the effective NCI percentage will be another 45% because added up, that will become 100% in total. So that's from the parent to sub subsidiary's perspective. But what about from the parent to subsidiary then? So parent to subsidiary, so the controlling interests, of course, as you can say, we own 75% of super, and hence the NCI percentage would be another 25%. But the question is, why are we going to calculate this then? As I said to you before, for the effective percentage, when calculating the growth of the sole companies, the SOP subsidiary, we have to apply it in there. So, 55 for 45%. So, first of all, to NCI, to so is to be 45%. Of course, for super, we are using the traditional NCI percentage, which is worth at 25%, you agree? Because 25% of super belong, uh, I mean, it's the NCI, belongs to shareholders who do not control the company. So 25% for super. And then for the reserve, so for the growth, so first of all, for super, we've got 75%. And then for so, we've got 55%. Okay, so that's the logic behind it. So that's how we utilize the first of our adjustments on top of this basic group is the effective percentage. Okay, no problem for that whatsoever. Now let's take a look at something that's more exciting. So as you can see from the extracts from the SFP, always see that in the question. So we've got the parents, we've got subsidiary, and we've got sub-subsidiary company. And under the non-current assets, the example will tell you that's the investment in home. So for example, from Patrick's perspective, is $60 belonging to the investment in subsidiary. That means is the parent put $60 in the subsidiary's company. So if that's the case then, because there'll be no changes in ownership in this particular question, so we're gonna deem that cost worth of 60 will simply be the fair value if there's no other accounting errors has been made. So if that's the case, then we simply slot that into the good we're working. So, for super, the fair value of consideration is to be 60 that's made by the parents' company, Kopatchik. Okay. So also, for Patrick's perspective, we've made $20 as the investment in a sub sub. So put that down. In a sole company, first of all, we've got $20 here. And then we also have got $50 that is made from the, subs, uh, from the subsidiary to the sub-subsidiary company called Sol. So from super to Sol, we've made $50 here. So just put that down, okay, and slot the numbers in. So that's how we do it. So we slot those investments into working free when calculating a good one. So here's the thing. Related to the good way, we we'll have to do the adjustment, as you can see before. If I remind you, for the third of our difference here, we're going to debit the NCI and credit the goodwill in the sub sub. So why this is the case then? So let's see then. So the adjustments that we're going to make is simply we're going to do the adjustments here. We're going to take the NCI percentage times the investment that is made from the subsidiary to a sub sub. And in this case, the NCI percentage, as you can see before, is to be 25% here.
and the investments made from the subsidiary to a sub sub is fifty dollars. And hence, in this case, uh, twenty five times fifty percent. So let me just calculate that. Fifty times not point twenty five, which gives us twelve point five. So what we can do for this adjustment, we simply credit the goodwill of 12.5 and we are going to debit the NCI in the working form of 12.5. And we will put this for goodwill is in the sub sub, but the NCI we're going to put that into the sub. So let's go to working for then. So this is the adjustment. taken from working free is 12.5 okay from the subsidiaries column but you may have a question well Steve why are we going to do that it's so complicated isn't it well the logic behind it is not complicated at all so think about it this way so why are we going to minus the NCI percentage of the investments that the subsidiary makes to a sub sub well think about it this way you only control the subsidiary. You only own 75% of that super, right? So that means if super has made $100 worth of profit, $75 would belong to Patrick. And this means if super has made $100 of loss, then Patrick will be entitled to that uh, $75 of loss, right? Because I've owned 75% of your company called super and that means for example in this case super has invested their money worth of 50 to a sub, sub subsidiary company called Sol, and that means only 75 percent of that 50 belongs to Patrick and hence 25 percent does not belong to me because that 25% belongs to those shareholders who is outside the group. They do not control the company. So that means when we are considering the goodwill for the sub subsidiaries company, for example, the internally generating tangible asset of the soul, we only consider the value that's actually belonging to our group, to our parents' company. We don't consider those proportion that does not belong to the company, which is worth 25%. And hence, what we need to do then, into working free for the goodwill, we have to minus that 25% does not belong to a group. And that's it. Okay, so that's the first circumstance here. And secondly, why are we going to debit the NCI into the subsidiary then? If we go to the NCI in the subsidiary, so, the subsidiaries NCI are those shareholders who are outside the group who does not control over the organisation. And hence, when calculating their value from the group's perspective, because we incorporate that into a group, we cannot bring that 12.5%, which is the NCI percentage of the investments that you've made to the sub subsidiaries company, because that does not uh, belong to our organization, our group in other words. So we're gonna adjust for that. We're gonna minus it from the subsidiary's perspective. Right, so that's the logic behind it. So these are the adjustments that we need to make. Anything else will be just to be the same as before. First of all, effective percentage, we've done that. Secondly, this adjustment, this single entry, is debit the NCI, creates the goodwill, job's done. Any other thing else? That will be the same in the basic group. Okay, so we threw the scenario then in the yeah. So we use the full group method and the fair value of the NCI is twenty four thousand and so is to be twenty three thousand. So twenty four and twenty three. So we debit the goodwill and credit the NCI. So twenty four and twenty three. And also the parents reserve is to be 230 at the consultation date. 
So that's how we do it. And also we are told the net assets lists of the supan so just to copy that directly uh, into the working two. So first of all we've got the share capital is 20 and 20 and 10 and 10. That would be the same as before, same as in the question. The reserve is 60 and 230 with our adjustments here because simplify the question. And hence, same as the in the question, so 8250, 40, 100. So as you can see, the net asset growth is to be 170, and then 60 here. So we're going to slot that both in the working four as well as in the working five. So slot that then. Working four, 70, and 60 here. So that will give us 42. 0.5 and 27. Add it all up for the NCI in total, 54 and 50. And for the working five, slot that, 170 and 60. And that will give us 127.5 and 33. In total, 390.5. And of course, working three, adding it all up. So fair value of net assets. And the date of acquisition is to be 80 and 40. So slot that here. So that will give us 4 and then 40.5. Adding it up, 44.5. Okay. Right, so that's how we calculate the um, goodwill, 44.5. NCI. 104 and then reserve which is 390.5 okay so that's how we deal with this question called Patrick okay that's how we deal with this question called Patrick right just a quick summary as what we've seen before so complex group means within a group we've got the sub sub and there'll be mainly for, from the accounting's perspective two major difference between the complex and simple group we have to apply for the effective percentage in relation to the sub sub when calculating the growth of net asset into NCI as well as the reserve. And also, we're going to debit the NCI in the sub and credit the goodwill in the sub sub. So that's the uh, difference between these two. Hope you're happy within the complex group section here, and that's the end of it. And the next of our section, we will go through a full example related to a complex group consolidation. I'll see you in the next of our section. APC, accounting for your future.